All right, if you would like to find in your Bibles uh, Psalm 103, Psalm 103, and our theme for this whole Easter weekend is Love Stands in the Gap. And so this is part one this morning, and uh, part two will be on Sunday morning. Love is the motivation for the cross. And uh, over a thousand years before Jesus lived, died, and rose again, uh, David, King David, wrote these words that we find here in Psalm 103. And we're going to read from verses 8 to 14. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on all who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Love stands in the gap. And in the time that we have together, this is not a long message, but I hope that it is a profound and deeply impacting message for each and every one of us. I want to spend time looking at the measure of God's love and the measure of God's forgiveness as reflected in the words that King David so beautifully wrote over 3,000 years ago. So let's have a look at the measure of God's love, first of all. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. King David wrote these words in 1034 BC, and he wrote them out of a, a time of deep failure and personal anguish. If you know the story of King David at all, you can read it in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we refer to as the Old Testament. But King David um, uh, stayed away from the battle, and when he was at home, he saw this woman, Bathsheba, and he desired her. He, she was already married, but long story short is that they committed adultery together, and then David realized that um, he had done the wrong thing, and then he tried to cover up his transgression by having her husband put on the front line of the battle, uh, Uriah, and then he ended up dying. And so this is fairly major stuff here, adultery and murder to cover up the first crime. And so David, of course, if you read in the Old Testament, uh, of course, justice really from our perspective wasn't done for what he did because he was a king. And in those days, kings were not really subject to the justice of society, but he certainly was subject to the justice of God. And he suffered a, a, a period of, of punishment uh, under the hand of God. But then God doesn't, as we've just read there, God doesn't punish forever any more than a good parent would punish forever. Uh, he is compassionate and kind and just. And so over the process of time, King David received the pardon and forgiveness of God. And he wrote this song, this psalm, as a reflection of his gratitude for the forgiveness and love of God reflected after his major mistakes. This is the measure of God's love. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Now, in the Hebrew mindset, the ancient Hebrews of 1034 BC, the heavens would refer to two things. First of all, it would refer to the dome where the clouds move. Their concept was very different to ours. We have the benefit of all of the science and astronomy and all of that kind of thing. But back in those days, they saw life very much from their own perspective. And so to the ancient Hebrews, in fact, the ancient world, the earth was a flat, round disk. That's what they saw. It seemed to just curve around, and it was flat. And, and, and it, people would drop off the end if you walk too far or sail too far. There are still people in the world today who believe that the earth is flat. Uh, if you are one of those people, I just want to make sure that you know that you are very welcome here. Uh, we love you despite your feelings about the flat earth. That is fine. The Flat Earth Society in America grew last year by about 100 people 
I think they have about 130 now. <laughs> but that's the way they viewed uh, life. And so they looked at it, they saw the sky, and the sky looked like a dome. And so in their perspective, heaven was up and hell was underneath the earth. And they thought that the sun, uh, when it set, hurried back under the earth and then came over again. That was their whole perspective. And you find that reflected uh, especially in some of the Psalms. And so that was what they thought of was the heavens. They would look up and they would see the clouds. That's a long way. And David's saying, wow, God's love is that great. But then he would go one step further because they also believed that the heavens were where the stars were. And they realized that at night, the stars were further away than the dome that was over this flat disk earth. And so David goes one step further here and wow, the love of God stretches so far, it stretches even to those lights. Now, of course, fast forward to our present day, over 3,000 years later, and uh, with the benefit of science and astronomy and all that's taken place, we realize just how big this universe really is. In fact, we don't even know how big the universe is because it's still expanding. But we know how big our, our galaxy is. It's um, 80 thousand light years in diameter, the Milky Way. I'm not referring to a chocolate bar, I'm referring to what we live in. The Milky Way, 80,000 years to cross it at the speed of light, about 300,000 kilometers per second. If we were to go to the next nearest galaxy, the next major galaxy, not a dwarf galaxy, it's about two and a half million light years away. In other words, it would take you two and a half million years traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second to get from where we are today to the next nearest galaxy. If we're going to go, we should go fairly quickly after the service. <laughs> Grab a coffee and a hot cross bun and let's scoot. I was fascinated in the news just during the week that astronomers and scientists all around the world, they've been working on this project for quite a while, but they've discovered uh, this new black hole, uh, thanks to eight massive telescopes being hooked up all around the world. Some of you may have seen this on the news. If you haven't, Dr. Google can help you and, uh, and, and check this out because it is absolutely amazing. They wired up all of these um, uh, telescopes. Well, I actually don't know how they did it, <laughs> but whatever they did, they did it. <laughs> wired them up because <laughs> I know so much about science. And I do know that, that they all had to be synchronized with this incredible atomic clock on each one that couldn't even lose one second in a million years. And I know about that because I read it, so it must be true. <laughs> but this was a phenomenal project, and they have discovered what is the most massive black hole ever known. It's in a small galaxy, 250 million light years away. And it's got a mass that is equivalent to 17 billion suns. So this thing is absolutely amazing. We've, this is it here, okay? Um, the black hole is the black hole. <laughs> this thing has a gravitational pull that is so strong that space and time around it are inescapably modified. I mean, that just boggles my mind that time can be warped. I mean, let's do the time warp again. <laughs> and that they're actually sucked in. Nothing, uh, not even light can move fast enough to escape the black hole, which is why it's a black hole. Gravitational pull, once it passes a certain boundary known as the event horizon, everything just gets sucked into this thing, 250 million light years away. Our nearest star is 4.24 light years away. It would take you at the speed of light over 137,000 years to get there. This is phenomenal. The fastest speed a person has ever gone was the crew in Apollo 10, and they traveled as they looped around the uh, moon coming back to the earth at 40, just under 40,000 kilometers per hour. And so thanks to modern science, we get a, a little inkling into how great this solar system, galaxy, the other galaxies, the black holes, the universe 
how immense it is. And so if we read David's words in the light of all of our knowledge today, we get an even greater insight into how amazing God's love is. Because as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And so from our perspective, the love of God is even more immense than David ever imagined when he penned those words. One of the things I've loved doing over the years is reading to our kids uh, when, they're, when they're younger, although I was reading to Trinity uh, a few months ago and Gigi heard that I was going to read uh, a story and so I had Trinity one side and Gigi the other. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. But I've loved reading to our kids, you know, at bedtime over the years. And Trinity's only 10, she's nearly 11, but she still loves to snuggle and we read a story together and then pray and, you know, we have a little bedtime routine, which is really, really cool. One of my favourite books, and some of you may have read this, is Guess How Much I Love You. This is, this is just beautiful. So this is covered now because it was getting a bit, a bit um, kind of worn. But um, this tells the story of big nut brown hair and little nut brown hair and it's bedtime, and, and little nut brown hair is trying to say how much he loves his dad, but the dad keeps beating him. Uh, not like physically. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, you know, I love you more. So little nut brown hair puts his little arms out, goes, I love you this much, and then the dad goes, yeah, but I love you this much. Okay, you're bigger, and so on and so forth. And they get to this beautiful part at the end where um, little nut brown says, I love you right up to the moon. He said as he closed his eyes. Oh, that's far, said Big Nut Brown Hair. That is very far. Big Nut Brown Hair settled Little Nut Brown Hair into his bed of leaves. He leaned over and kissed him goodnight. And then he lay down close by and whispered with a smile, I love you right up to the moon and back. <sighs> Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and that's what God is saying to us except his distance is bigger. I love you this much. In fact, really, that's what Jesus was saying on the cross. Good Friday, I love you this much. I love you this much. Somewhere else, David said this in another Psalm, Psalm 107, whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. So that's the measure of God's love. And then finally, the measure of God's forgiveness. And, and it, David says these words in that Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The word transgression is probably not used as much these days, but it can also mean trespass or trespasses. And we've probably all seen those signs uh, on different people's property. Um, they can say keep out or no trespassing or, or various types. I've, I went online yesterday and I saw these ones. Prayer is the best way to meet God. Trespassing is the fastest. <laughs> Here lies the last trespasser. <laughs> and is there life after death? Trespass here and find out. <laughs> when I was um, uh, a kid or younger, probably about 10 or 11, uh, we had an apple orchard nearby our home in the UK before we emigrated to Australia. And on the way home, <clears throat> my friends and I, we walked past this apple orchard and it had big signs out the front saying no trespassing. But when you're 10, that just does not apply to you. You know what I'm saying? And so we used to hop over there on a regular basis and, uh, and go what the British call scrumping. We, we went apple scrumping, which basically means stealing. And, uh, and so we trespassed on a regular basis. We never got caught, and Jesus has forgiven me, <laughs> which I'm very grateful for. The Bible gives us boundaries or fences. As we read through there, there's certain guidelines, fences, and basically the Bible says to us, and God is saying to us, don't trespass in that territory. And it's not because God is a cosmic killjoy. He knows that if we go into an area where the Bible says don't go, that some harm may happen to us or to others. And so the no trespassing of God is actually an expression of his love. The fact is, though, that we all do trespass. We all give in to the temptation and intrigue gets to us all from time to time. And we say, found our, find ourselves saying things like, I wonder what it would be like. Or, surely it won't hurt just this once. Or, it won't hurt anyone else, so it's fine. 
and we use other justifications like these, and then we trespass or we transgress, and then we suffer the penalty, the shame, and the guilt. That's the bad news. The good news is this. This wonderful promise from God in Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far he removed our transgressions from us. Now, remember, David had no real understanding of the way the world really was, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote these words, and I'm, I'm fascinated that he chose east to west rather than north to south. Because if he said, as far as the north is from the south, so far has God removed our transgressions from us, that's a measurable point. North Pole to South Pole would be about 20,000 kilometers. The good news is that God removes our transgressions or our trespasses as far as the east is from the west. If you go around the world, if you, keep, if you head east, you will always go east. If you go west, you will always be heading west. If it's in a straight line, then west and east, and they never meet. In other words, it's a non-measurable distance. That's how far God removes our transgressions, our trespasses, and the guilt of them, and he brings in forgiveness. That is how great the love and the forgiveness of God is for every single person within the sound of my voice and beyond. Think about that in relation to King David and what he did with the adultery and the, and, and, and the murder to cover it all up and how grateful he was out of all of that that he could receive the forgiveness and the grace of God. Now, it would be easy for us to justify ourselves comparing ourselves with David and saying, well, I'm not that bad. I've never murdered anyone. I've never committed adultery. I'm actually really a good person. But as good as we think we are, we have all trespassed. We have all transgressed and we all need God's love and forgiveness. And God is so willing to give it that he even expressed it in a song written 3,053 years ago and preserved it for our encouragement. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. And so on this Good Friday, we remind ourselves of the compassionate, gracious love of God that is higher than the heavens. We rejoice that our transgressions, our trespasses have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west, from one scarred hand to the other. In the Roman Empire days, they used to use the cross, the X, to cross out mistakes. Um, they still do the same today. When I was at school, uh, these are also kisses. Um, and I used to think that my teacher loved me a lot. <laughs> but then I found out that they were actually wrong answers. <laughs> but it's fascinating that we still use that sign that was started in the Roman Empire all those thousands of years ago, the cross. And on the cross, Jesus crossed out all of our sins, all of our mistakes, our transgressions, our trespasses to be continued on Sunday morning. Amen. Amen.